I'm very pleased to welcome Hélène Ubi, who is the CEO of The Exploration Company. And she has the, um, the honor of being the only woman, I think this is still correct, Hélène, the only woman in the world to run a space company. The only woman in the world to run a space company. Is this, this is still true? To run, let's say, a, a rocket, a spaceship capsule company. Yeah, this is, this is correct. <laughs> there, are, there are other women also running <laughs> space companies, but let's say. The, the, for whatever reason, the vehicle part, the transportation part, uh, has not been led so far by a woman, so okay. Okay. Bill, this sounds like inspiring stuff enough. And I mean, the whole economics of space has taken something that used to be the subject of science fiction novels to now a genuine business opportunity for you and for lots of people who work in this industry. So we're going to dive a little bit into that and talk about your experience of running this business and what got you there. So the exploration company says you make space exploration affordable, sustainable and open, a global endeavour with European roots. But I can't book a flight tomorrow. So tell me what it is that your business is doing right now. Yeah, so we are doing space capsule. Uh, I think probably everyone you know, here in the room uh, has seen astronauts going to the Dragon, or astronauts going to the Soyuz, right? So you have China doing space capsule, you have the United States doing space capsules, you have Russia doing space capsule, and we are the first in Europe to do space capsule. So we'll start with cargo, bring cargo to space stations, and today you have two space stations around the Earth, the International Space Station and the Chinese Space Station. Tomorrow, so at the end of the decade, you probably have three, four, five space stations around the Earth. It's a market which is growing very fast. And then you have now two stations being built around the moon. And you have very, very few vehicles, and Europe has no vehicle to go to these new destinations. Mm. Um, so you can actually, if you go on our website, not, you cannot book, a, let's say, a, a seat as a human. Not yet. Because, not yet, because it takes, it takes 10 years. It takes testing. It, it takes a lot of testing. <laughs> it takes it's quite complex. Uh, but if you want to send a postcard, or if any of your children, you just go on our website and you actually have a B2C platform uh, where you can you know, send stuff in space, uh, whatever is important for you. And we have the first flight this year in, in August, actually. So it's moving quite fast. So the first flight in August? Yeah. And that, that is to test? It's called the NYX vehicle? Yeah, our vehicle is called NYX. Uh, perhaps just to give some, some figures and etc. So we are 18 months old, like you know, baby starting walking. Uh, we've raised on about 50 million. Uh, we just closed the biggest Series A ever raised in Europe by a space tech company in quite difficult economic circumstances. Mm. Uh, we run about 60 people right now uh, with a headquarter in Germany and uh, and Switzerland in France. And so we built first first thing we did is we built a baby capsule. Uh, because we had to start like privately funded, right? So we cannot build a huge vehicle. We started with something where we could prove basically that we can deliver on track, on quality, on schedule. Um, and this baby capsule is going to fly in August. That's a demonstrator. We're going to re-enter the atmosphere. You have to be very stable. You have to sustain temperature around about 1,800 degrees while maintaining internal temperature around about 45 degrees. And so that's this year. Next step is next year already, October 24. We're going to fly a teenage capsule. 1.6 ton, 2.5 meter diameter, so you already can sit inside. Mm -hmm. Again, no humans, but cargo, and here we have real clients. So we have a European Space Agency, which has bought two payloads, they're flying two payloads with us. We have Airbus flying with us. Uh, we have uh, the French Space Agency, German Space Agency, so let's say the core space agency are flying payloads with us, and this is for October 24, and we launch with SpaceX. And what is it that these space agencies and these businesses want to fly into space? What is it that they, that they will pay you to transport up into space? Is this about science? Is it about experimentation? Yeah, so I think what's super interesting is that traditionally, space stations were a place where it was all about science and also international cooperation. Uh, it was... Um, built at the beginning by, by, the, by the Russian, uh, then the Americans joined, then we came out to the International Space Station, which is a beautiful concept. And it was all about preparing, making experiments, basically to prepare us as humans to live in space. And uh, what is happening now is two things which are, I think are going to change profoundly the infrastructure uh, business in space. The, the, the first uh, thing is that we've discovered doing science in space station that there are lots of things that can serve the Earth, not only done for space, but like really serve the Earth. Like uh, microgravity, for example, in an environment where stem cells, uh, they grow faster, they grow, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you, you, have, uh, you can grow them in a more sustainable manner, more solid manner. So this is huge for, for example, pharma industry. 
only point was, okay, it costs a lot of money to bring that stuff up there, mm. so is it worth? But if you have like flights regularly uh, in the year and it's not costing huge money, then you start having a business model for basically private research being numbered there and useful for the earth. So that's one main trend. And the second trend is basically the arrival of Starship, which is a huge launcher of, uh, of uh, SpaceX. That's going to make it not only cheaper to build infrastructure in space, but also um, easier in the sense that we're going to able to, we will be able to send huge volumes, five times uh, the volume we can send right now. And so I think this will trigger an era of new infrastructures in space, not only for uh, living in space, but also for storing stuff in space, and of mm -hmm. course also for military purposes. And, and so the first of those where you're talking about serving the science community, yeah. for example, you call that the boomerang effect, I think, where this is something that benefits us down on Earth. Is that the most compelling reason? If we step, take a step back and think about why, why go to space, why explore space, um, is that the most compelling reason? Is, is it because it serves life on Earth? I mean, because you can look around Earth and see plenty of things to throw money at, plenty of problems that need fixing. So I suppose when you, when you do that, sometimes you ask yourself, well, why do we need to go to space? Is the boomerang effect one of the reasons? So I speak perhaps uh, generally and then also perhaps for the expression company, why are we doing what we're doing? But generally speaking, uh, okay, there is lots of sometimes noise about, okay, space, it pollutes, and then, you know, there are billionaires going in space, and, okay, I think if we take some distance, uh, you know, space is a place where you have all the imagery satellites, so this is the only way we can understand climate change, and now this data has become critical for farmers to optimize the way they use water, they use fertilizer, it has become critical for logistic companies to optimize um, let's say, to use basically less energy, it's becoming also very important, of course, for financial markets. So, so all this imagery coming from space is a huge tool on the Earth to, let's say, optimize our activities and make them more efficient. So that's one part. The second part in the, the boomerang effect is when you're on space station, um, you have to recycle everything. It's not like, hey, I'm opening the, you know, I'm going to have some tap water. Mm. There is no tap water in the space station. There are three sources of water. Urine from the astronauts, which is fully recycled. The humidity of when we speak, you know, you create humidity. And then the little bit of the water which is remaining from experiments. And that's it. That's it. So you can imagine the recycling system that have been put in place. And actually the membrane that we use on Earth to purify water have been invented for the space station. Other things which are done in space station is like, they are reusing the plastic bag transforming into powder, then print the powder, and with this powder printed, do repair pieces for the station. You scale that on Earth, I mean, you solve plastic problems, right, and you do some repair pieces for aviation or mm. in the automotive industry, whatever. So there are still lots of technologies that has not been unleashed in space, but the space station is a kind of a, probably the most wonderful laboratory to test technologies that are going to make our, li our, our lives on Earth like, ways more sustainable, just because by definition it's so hard to live there, yes. you have to be super energy efficient and you have to recycle as much. And as extremely you can. innovative by the exactly. sounds of things. Exactly. So, so, uh, so that answers that question. You've mentioned being European a few times and I wondered how important that is. And I know that part of your background is having worked at, uh, at Airbus and clearly that's a European business. How important do you think it is that Europe has a strong presence in space? Yeah, I think actually it's critical. Uh, it's critical because, um, well, we've we had wars since like centuries, like since mm. ever in Europe, and, and I'm very very sad to see that we still have a war today, unfortunately. But okay, uh, between let's say countries like um, the like France, Germany, UK, we, we're now in peace now, and I think this cooperation spirit has become key for identity. And when you look up there. There has been a time when cooperation was possible, especially the space station between the United States and, and Russia. And today what we see up there is uh, confrontational development more and more. Um, and I have, let's say, the naivety to hope, and I believe, that if an alternative country comes here with a more sustainable manner to travel in space, that's why we're using green propellant, and that's why we're saying, hey, we are making space sustainable, we have a cooperative way of doing things. So, for example, we open source our interfaces so that we can, we can go to Chinese space station, Indian space station, to American space station. Well, 
we're not going to change the world, right? But if we can be a credible player, building literally real bridges between various infrastructures, this is very inspiring for what is happening on Earth. Mm. And I don't want to neglect the power of inspiration. I, I think when there are horrible wars on Earth and we see up there, you know, people with different nationalities still able to build friendship, whatever the nationalities are, just because they are human, that's a very important message. So that's, that's why I'm very proud that, you know, uh, that becoming a credible European player, not only it's important for the future of our children, because our future is happening up there. Yes. So if we have no capacity to go there, we just miss part of our future, point. But this can also have triple down effect on Earth, bringing this cooperative spirit in what is probably the future of humanity and where for the time being I see a lot of uh, confrontation and not so many corporations. Um, and you've mentioned sustainable. Why yeah. is, why is the, the NICS capsule, why is this more, more sustainable? Su more sustainable. <laughs> Three reasons. Uh, first, we use green propellant, which is also the first time ever in the world. Normally, you use hydrazine, and if you smell hydrazine, you're just dead. So it's, it's quite <laughs> toxic. <laughs> uh, the second reason is, uh, is that we are reusable. We're not the only ones. Space 6 also is reusable. But of course, you know, this improves the sustainability of the capsule. And third, uh, not for the first versions, but for the longer down the road, we're going to be able to refuel our capsule in space, meaning that we can use 40, 50 times the same vehicles, uh, and we don't have to come back to refuel and then launch again, which is a huge, uh, let's say, waste of energy and, and cost mm. also. You, you've mentioned SpaceX a few yeah. times, which makes me think of uh, the, 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 the voices that we hear more often, perhaps, talking about space travel, the, the very wealthy ones, the, the, the male voices that we hear often. What, what is it like working in the same space as, as, those, as those very la loud, very, very wealthy people who we hear a lot from, Ellen? What do they bring? Yeah, so I think first they are, uh, honestly, I mean, Musk is an inspiration for uh, every space engineer because he's achieved um, uh, incredible uh, things that many people thought, okay, it would, be pos it would not be possible to do a reusable launcher. He's done a reusable launcher and now the challenge is a mark the Starship is quite astonishing. So it's like when you're a painter, when you're a musician, you learn from the masters and then you become yourself a master. So I want to here be very humble. <coughs> Musk is, you know, has done amazing engineering things and we are learning from that. And of course, you know, like every, every, let's say, musicians in the being or in the becoming, you want to become at some point in time even better. But that's, that's not for today, but we are learning as fast as we can. The second point is, of course, I think the, the you know, management style, motivation, etc. Uh, we are very different, of course, at the exploration company and uh, the, with different what, motivations, by the sound of things. Different motivations. I think I explained a bit why I believe it's very important to have different players building this future of humanity. Uh, what we have is in common and with many people who work in space is that I think we are at a turning point. Where like in the 16th century, humanity was able to build ships that would be solid enough that we would cross the ocean and would explore. This took us 100 years. Beginning of the, of the, of the 20th century, we started with airplanes took us around about 100 years until it, it became, you know, democratized, etc. So we are at this point when we know, we're going to know within this decade how to build spaceships that can be reused, becomes affordable, and okay, if it takes 100 years so that everyone here can buy a ticket and fly in space, it, you know, it has to start with some pioneers. Uh, so I think this vision also is shared by, by others. Um, where I think we are perhaps very different. I'm aware that a business can, let's say, to succeed, you need to, um, yeah, let's say, implement uh, your, your vision. You need, of course, to be with the best team you can ever have, etc. cetera, blah, blah, blah. You need, you need also some luck, right? This is, this is I think, true. Uh, and where you don't need luck and where you have a responsibility, I believe, is to have your team thriving. So we're doing everything we can to succeed, and for the time being, we've been very successful, actually. Uh, but I feel a very strong responsibility that whatever happens, every people who have worked within the expression company, they can say, okay, it was the better job I ever had in my life. It's super demanding, but it's super rewarding, because as, as a person, you discover capacities. Mm. You even didn't know you had this capacity. 
And we make history at our, okay, level, but like we make history, what we're doing was never done in Europe. For some part of that was never done in the world. So you create meaning yeah. in the mind of these people and you can unleash their talents. You obviously believe uh, in, in what you're doing, Ellen. How, how big will the exploration, just bringing our conversation to a, to a close this evening, how big will the exploration company be in 10 years? Of course, you know, there are scenarios. I have plenty of financial, you trained, financial you people in, in the room. You were so a mathematician. Worst so. case, best case, middle case, etc. Uh, no, I think, you know, if we, if, we would, if we would be able to come up with, uh, let's say, a comprehensive system, uh, we start with a capsule, but uh, you know, down the road, there is also necessity for thinking about launcher uh, in a different manner, of course, and uh, reusing basically the bricks to have end-to-end uh, -end basically transportation system. So if we'd come up with that, something that would be highly affordable, that would be very open, we are the first again in the world to really open source our interfaces. Uh, it means like you can think about your hardware as a kind of space store. So if we could be like the transportation system, one of the transportation system, but like the most open, the most sustainable, um, enabling clients from everywhere to use, I would say, our hardware, not only as a transportation, but also like a store, like mm -hmm. literally like, okay, you have software development kits, but like would have hardware development kits so you can plug and you can use our hardware to unleash your imagination and, and build on us basically. I think, yeah, this would have bring a lot to the space community. So. Uh, but okay, we start with a capsule. <laughs> okay, starting with a capsule and starting with sending postcards. Ellen, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much to Ellen Ubi, the co-founder of the Exploration Company. Thank you.